This, is my second video, exploring the effects of ultraviolet light, on Geiger Muller tubes. I have bought a couple of new types of GM tube, and have performed a series of experiments, that I hoped would settle this matter, once and for all. After the last video, the comments section exploded, with viewers sharing their own experiences and experimental results. What I had intended to be a short video, detailing my own results, actually seems to have opened up a whole can of worms. Later, I am going to ask you to help me make the next video, by performing some simple experiments yourself. So if you enjoy learning through experimentation, then please consider this video a call to arms. In my last video, I tested using five different sources, and I had no real sense of the operating wavelengths of these ultraviolet emitters. This time, I'm going to figure that part out first. On Taobao, I found an interesting thing, it's an optical spectrometer, that claims to be able to measure light from 300, to 1200 nanometers. Even better, it only costs 49 US dollars. It uses the free software from Thermino, which has pretty limited functionality, but is more than sufficient for my needs. It even came with a compact fluorescent light that is used to calibrate the device. I have built one of these devices before, using a DVD, and an old webcam but this one seems to have a much wider spectral range. Let's start with that UV sterilizing wand. I had my doubts about this device, in particular its claim to be able to produce rays in the UVC band. The emissions peak at about 450 nanometers, so clearly there is no ultra, in this violet. I will discard this useless piece of snake oil. When I tested the UV curing box, this does have some UV, but at around 395 nanometers. So this isn't very useful either. This is my smallest UV flashlight. It seems to have a spectral peak at around 365 nanometers, but also has quite a lot of other light in its spectra. Here is another flashlight that has the same 365 nanometer peak, so is going to be useful for these experiments. This one has the same characteristic peak, but appears to have a higher radiant flux, so I will use this one for testing. Just for fun, I also took a look at some other flashlights, such as this white one. The way that this spectrum gets created is very interesting, but perhaps that is for another video. This infrared flashlight, is one that I made for some other fun projects. You can find these videos linked in the description. Before diving into the experiments, it might be useful to just take a look at what a Geiger Muller tube actually is, and how they work. GM tubes are actually very simple devices. They are little more than a sealed tube, filled with a low pressure gas, and they normally have two electrodes. They can be made of metal, glass or almost any other airtight material, that will allow the correct type of radiation to pass. Normally, the outer electrode is the cathode, and the inner one is the anode. Typically the cathode is held at a voltage close to ground and the anode has a high voltage positive charge applied. For the type of tubes used in consumer level counters, the applied voltage is in the 300 to 500 volt region. When ionizing radiation strikes the low pressure gas, it can knock some electrons free. Under the accelerating voltage, some of these electrons can then strike more gas atoms and start a cascade reaction. And this ionization, then causes the tube to pass some electrical current, resulting in a negative pulse for the detector to count. And this brings me to a critical part of the circuit, the anode resistor. This has two main functions, firstly it limits the current that can pass through the tube when it is ionized. 
The second important purpose of this resistor is that it helps to perform something called quenching. Quenching is the process that stops the ionization process from continuing indefinitely. Without quenching, the avalanche cascade breakdown would just continue and the tube would then become a simple discharge bulb. Quenching is also assisted with the addition of a halogen gas to the mixture in the GM tube, usually chlorine or bromine. And this brings me to another question. What gases are used in these tubes? The manufacturers almost never specify this. So, I thought I would try and find out. Looking on the Wikipedia entry for Geiger Muller tubes, there isn't much in the way of specific information. In general, the tubes appear to be filled with a mixture of a halogen and noble gases, at low pressure. I think I can figure out which of these noble gases, are used in each of the GM tubes, using my new spectrometer. I just need to apply a higher than normal voltage to the tubes, and measure the spectra of the glow. Noble gases are used because they have the highest ionization energies, and frankly it doesn't hurt that they are chemically inert. When I look at the captured spectra of each of the tubes, it is obvious that they all share the same gases. They all show the same main peak for helium at 587 nanometers, and that the main peaks for neon are also pretty clear too. However, what seems to be absent, in all three of the GM tubes I tested, are peaks for argon, krypton or xenon. As for the quenching gas that is used, I think that this was present in too low concentrations, for my cheap spectrometer to be able to detect. One very important aspect of the operation of Geiger-Muller tubes, is the operating voltage. This voltage needs to be held in what is called, the Geiger plateau, for correct operation. If the voltage is too low, then the sensitivity will be close to zero. But if the voltage is too high, then the tube gases will be able to ionize just from the effect of the large electric field. If the applied voltage is changing, say for example, due to changes in ambient temperature and humidity, then the sensitivity of the tube will also change. For these types of glass tubes, the change in sensitivity over the plateau, will be in the range of 10 to 15 percent. You might be wondering, how do glass tubes have an outer electrode? After all, glass isn't conductive. This is created by adding a layer of indium tin oxide to the inner surface of the glass envelope. Here I am using a card with an ultraviolet sensitive surface, you can clearly see where the conductive coating ends. This coating absorbs some ultraviolet light, because the shadow is a little lighter than the non-coated region of the tube. Anyway, that is enough background on the tubes, let's do some experiments. I first started out on an ambitious series of experiments. These started not long after I uploaded the first video. There were just so many different test cases to explore. I tested each tube, at different voltages, with different anode resistors. I tested with both background and also with the tube being exposed to elevated radiation levels. I generated over 30 hours of 4K video footage, meticulously recording my experiments. And then, something rather wonderful happened. One of the viewers, sent me some very short videos of his own simple experiments. In just a few short seconds, I realized the folly of my ways, and that there was a better way to do this. What was needed was a simpler and more accessible series of experiments, something that would allow, almost any viewer to be able to contribute to this project. A crowd-sourced experiment. First, let me show you the simpler experiments that I have done, hopefully this will get the ball rolling. To start with, I am going to test the 5 cheap Geiger counters that I own. All of these devices use the J321GM tube. I am going to test their sensitivity to ultraviolet and also measure the tube voltage. 
This is the Bosian FS5000, and I wasn't able to measure any UV sensitivity. The HFS10, with its externally connected tube, also didn't respond to my UV source. But, the HTT60, which doesn't have particle clicks, did generate a dose rate alarm. The GC01, was also sensitive to UV exposure of the tube. And like the HTT60, this only happened with exposure near to the cathode contact. My BR6 device, didn't show any sensitivity to ultraviolet at all. So now, we can go on to measuring the tube voltages for each of these products. To do that, we are going to need to make a simple high impedance measurement probe. We can't just use a standard multimeter to make this measurement. Later, I will show you how to make and calibrate this probe. This has an impedance of 100 mega ohms and a calibration factor of about 112. Starting with the FS5000, after adjusting for my calibration factor, I get a tube voltage of 407 volts. As I measured the tube voltages for each of the counters, it very quickly became clear that the two devices that exhibited some ultraviolet sensitivity were operating the tube at a higher voltage than those that didn't. In all of the devices, the anode resistor was the same value, i.e. 2 mega ohms. So this variable was removed from the equation. I don't know the exact shape of the graph of sensitivity versus voltage for the J321 tube, but I do know the endpoints for the Geiger Plateau region. And when I plot the approximate locations for the tube voltages, it becomes pretty clear that the two devices that showed some sensitivity to ultraviolet, were operating outside of the correct voltage range. I also wanted to test if there was some unit-to-unit -unit tolerance in the tubes, so I did a further experiment. I directly exchanged the same tube between three different devices, to see if any effects followed a particular tube, or if the effect followed the product. In this one case, the ultraviolet sensitivity followed the product and not the tube. It does need to be pointed out that I have only tested one tube, so this is by no means conclusive. Anyway, now it's time to explain what I have in mind for this crowdsourced experiment. If you have gotten this far through the video, then there is a high chance you are interested in this experiment. I really do hope that you are able to participate, this channel doesn't have a lot of subscribers, so don't assume that you can just sit back and watch millions of others do this instead. If you have a cheap Geiger counter, a UV torch and a multimeter, then you have pretty much everything you need to do this quick experiment. If there are enough participants, then I will make another of these videos, and will include at least a part of every experiment video. And don't worry about the quality of your experiment, because personally, I have never considered myself to be much of an experimenter either. Experimental science is a very specialized subject and one that requires a very specific mental toolkit. It is not enough to just tinker and test. For the great experimenters, like Michael Faraday, what set them apart from mere mortals, was a deep, and almost intuitive insight into where, and how, to look for the key underlying principles. Whilst we cannot all be the next Michael Faraday, we can all learn from experimentation. My little channel is rather fortunate to have the YouTube creator, Neptunium, as one of its viewers. If you want to see what it is possible for a home experimenter to achieve, then just take a look at his channel. This rather intrepid gentleman is building a particle accelerator in his garage. Yes, you heard that right, he is building a fucking particle accelerator, and he is doing it in a shed. I guess that means we have our very own Uncle Rick as one of our viewers. Perhaps it is best to first discuss the possible outcomes from my own tests, before looking at the goals of the larger, crowdsourced experiment. 
For starters, in my tests there was no real ultraviolet sensitivity, so long as the tube voltage was within the limits, defined by the tube manufacturer. My second conclusion, was that assuming that the tube was being supplied with the correct voltage, then all three of the tube types that I tested, behaved about the same. Finally, it was obvious that I know absolutely nothing, about the manufacturing tolerances of either the tubes or the Geiger counters that they are fitted to. And this is where you can help. If you build the simple high impedance probe, then together we will be able to see the spread of the tube voltages. On many of these cheap detectors, there is only a very crude level of voltage control being implemented. If enough people are able to help with this experiment, then it might be possible to see if there is a significant spread in the manufacturing tolerances, of the tubes themselves. If there is enough data to draw some real conclusions, then what I would like to try and do, is to use this data to figure out how to turn cheap crappy detectors into more accurate and consistent devices. Okay, let's talk about how to build and calibrate that simple high impedance probe. I just used a banana plug, to crocodile clip cable I had lying around. I bought some 100 meg and 1 meg ohm resistors to form the potential divider. After soldering the resistors and the cables, I added some heat shrink tubing to protect the probe from damage, and to make it look a little more presentable. Here is the schematic for the probe. Before moving on, I just want to be clear about one point. This is not a high voltage probe. It must not be used for purposes other than measuring the tube voltages of GM tubes. I do not take any responsibility for misuse of this device. It is very easy to calibrate the probe, first of all, use the standard multimeter probes to measure a voltage that is of a reasonable level, in this case I have used a bench power supply, turned up to its maximum voltage. In this case 31.4 volts. Then measure the same voltage using your new high impedance probe. Simply divide the first number by the second to get your own calibration factor. In my case, this is about 112, but each probe and multimeter combination will be slightly different. So, just multiply by your calibration factor to get your true voltage. The purpose of these crowdsourced experiments, is not just to validate my own results, with regard to UV sensitivity of GM tubes, but has a larger purpose. To determine just how repeatable these kinds of low-cost instruments actually are. So, hopefully, we can not only learn something new, but also figure out how to improve our equipment. To perform this experiment, you will need a Geiger counter that has a glass GM tube. Go ahead and open up your counter and look inside. Then, expose the tube to UV light, and video the results. Ideally, using a source of ultraviolet that claims to have a 365 nanometer wavelength. If you have other UV sources, then by all means, show the results from those too. Try and do the UV tests in a darkened room, so that if ionization is occurring, it will be clearly visible. And then measure the tube voltage, with a high impedance probe. And that's it, you're all done. Just upload your video to YouTube, or any other platform you like. Be sure to include the tube voltage in the description, and any other observations you found. If you upload to YouTube, you should just check that the setting to allow others to use your video is set. On the upload page, click, show more. Then be sure that the allow embedding is checked. Then in a comment add a link to your video in the post on the community page, or if you prefer, as a direct comment to this video. If I haven't replied to you within two days, then keep trying until I do. And if you find this video and it is several months old, you can still contribute. I will continue to make new videos on the subject as more viewers add their results.
good data, is one thing that you can never have too much of. Anyway, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed my little video, or at least found some parts of it interesting. If you want to see more of this kind of video, you could always press the subscribe button. This is not a commercial channel, nor will it ever be, so I can say what I want, and YouTube's algorithm can go and get f***ed. Thank you for your time.